So we, we are going to talk about saris today. And what sari, as in the name, uh, has for a lot of Indian clothes, right? Anything that's flowy. But what we mean by sari is this five-yard fabric, six-yard fabric. It's about a yard in width and it's basically draped around your body. There is no stitching involved, even though modern day there is some stitching involved. Uh, so we'll, let's, let's, let's talk about how it started and how it got to this point, to this version that you are seeing here today. So sari dates back about 7,000 years. Now, surprisingly, we have an archaeologist here who actually worked at that site where some of those things came from. Uh, so in the early days, sari was basically a rectangular fabric that was draped around your waist, around your chest, and sometimes around your head. So what you see in these early years here, and sorry, I'm going to... My voice is going to go away, so I can repeat it. But what you see here is sari is draped around the waist. And the part of the sari is basically taken in between your legs and then is tucked on your back, of you, on your back basically. In modern day, you want me to? Yeah, I can do that. OK. Cool. So in modern day, it's called kashta. And since we just have ladies here, there was no bra or blouse back then, right? So I think that's very liberating. So they were way ahead of us. So, you know, thank God for COVID. Now we all know what it feels like to not wear one. But <laughs> these women 7,000 years ago had it right. Um, and over here, this is a more recent uh, picture, but as you can see, the sari is draped a little bit more around your body and it's taken on your shoulder. So this is a version that came later on. Uh, and we'll talk about how it evolved from this to this in a little bit. Uh, so the word sari comes from the Sanskrit word satika, and it has three parts. Antariya means the inner garment, Uttariya means the outer garment. So <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So what you see here, this bottom part, it's the antariya. Uttariya is a garment you would take as a shawl on all your shoulder. <coughs> and stanapatta, stan basically means breasts. So if you're covering your breasts, then you would use a garment called as stanapatta. None of these garments were stitched because back then, people in Indian subcontinent didn't know sewing or stitching. So that's why they were basically rectangular fabrics just wrapped around your body. Um, but that's not enough. Sari evolved with time. And Greeks had a lot of influence on sari. So the picture, the statue we saw earlier where some of the women had fabric on their shoulder, that came from the Greco-Roman influence on the sari. And um, one of the Indian kings, the Maurya, from um, I think they were like six to 700 BC, the king married a Greek princess, Cornelius. And she was fashionable for the time and she introduced taking one of the sides of this draped fabric on your shoulder. So that's, that's where some of, what the, one of the first variation of sari came from that time. Uh, next came the Persians. And you would you would ask, like, why are all these people going to India? The Greeks and the Romans and the, the Persians, why are they showing up? So you have to imagine uh, India, that's not a third world country, right? Like back in the day, and you probably know this, it was a thriving civilization. 
And the, the Indian name back then was Sone Ki Chidiya, which literally means the golden bird. So India had prosperity, had gemstones and gold and silver. And you know, it's a culturally very vibrant and happening place. It's land of warriors and land of abundance. So a lot of people would hear about this magical land and would come, they would bring their influences and then they would take something back. So a so lot of the, so I mean, we are only going to talk about sari today, but probably there are much more educated people than me who, who can talk about how this trade happened both ways and how it sort of evolved all of the cultures around it. One of the other things that the Greeks bought was what we call today a kamarband, right? So, the, so that's how some of the people then started tying a thread around their waist to hold this fabric up. And now remember, the women were still not wearing anything on top, right? They are, they are still bare chested for the most part with the uttariya wrapped around their body. But the Persians, when they came, they bought these jackets, these gorgeous jackets. And not only the jackets, but they also bought some unique designs like the chintz, right? That's where they come from. Uh, if you've seen the beautiful flowers and things like that. And they, they were brought by the Persians. And the Indians then evolved uh, the jackets and learned stitching from the Persians. And that's how they made the first top, or this choli, as they call it. Uh, so they came somewhere in 1000 um, AD, those like that far back. Uh, so until then, uh, pretty much everybody just wore those rectangular fabrics tied in different knots. Later on came Mughals. And Mughals were people who came uh, so the Persians came from the west of India. Mughals came northwest of India. So they were Uzbeks, um, you know, in that region. And what they brought was embroidery and weaving, weaving techniques that were not known to Indian people back then. The complex weaving and, and the word I was telling you earlier about called king kap, that's a type of brocade weaving that Mughals brought to India. And the king cob weaving became so popular that people all over the world were talking about it because it was so intricate and so you could weave different shapes. And it, uh, like this jacket is showing, you know, they have weaved various animals. And this, this particular piece here or the piece of weaving here is called shikargard, which has all of the animals on it. And that, that was introduced by the Mughals. So if you, if you look at old Mughal paintings, you would see all the Mughal men, men's wearing these long dresses. And that was the first time in India they started stitching things. And the, the, the brocade technique was used in a town called Banaras, north of India. And then which later evolved into the, one of the most famous weave pieces that came from India called the Banarsi Sari. I don't have a real Banarsi Sari here today because believe it or not, I don't own a Banarsi Sari. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll show you what it looks like uh, a little bit later. But this pink cob, the type of weaving, which is a brocade weaving, very intricate, was the most famous type of weaving in the world with the most famous kind of fabric. And, and King Kaab basically means weave of the dreams or weaves from the heaven. And people basically died to own a piece of this fabric back then. So now we are, from where we started in 7,000 to now we are about 2,000 years from today, right? So that's far back. Um, that's where this sort of stitching came in and people started wearing stitched cholis or the upper cloth, and but they were still tying their saris on their waist. So there was no stitching involved in sari, just the upper chole. Then came the British. So um, before British, there were no petticoats. And you would, now since we are just, all of us are, this is a petticoat. This is the inner layer right 
and it usually matches the color of your sari so that if your sari is transparent, you know, your legs don't show. But before British, it was not a common place to wear petticoats. And British brought the petticoats in. As you can see, uh, you know, 17th, 18th century British women used to wear several layers under their gowns. So when they came to India, um, you know, I, I read somewhere that British uh, were extremely prude about it. And they were basically looking down on women who were not wearing petticoats or cholis, because most women did not wear cholis even back then. Their preferred way was to just wrap the sari around the body. So the British were very unhappy about it, and they wanted women to wear petticoats and blouses. But we have to thank the British for the blouses, because blouse today has become another way of making a statement, like a fashion statement, right? So I told you that people are now wearing just t-shirts underneath. But I think blouse in itself has become an evolution. Uh, people wear flutter sleeves and sleeveless and you know backless and I mean you name it. There are like thousands of varieties of blouses and that we have the British to thank for, for introducing that and to wear that with the sari. So by this time, sari looks very much like how it looks today. Uh, so back in the day, sari was a rectangular cloth wrapped around your body and stuck it between your legs. So it looked like a pant. Then came the Greeks. The fabric between your legs was gone. Sari just became a pleat and it went over the shoulder. Then came the Mughals. You started wearing the, the shirt or the the choli with your sari, and then the British came and you started wearing a petticoat and a better stitched blouse, you know, than what they had in the previous day. So with all of those influences and evolutions, you basically, what you're seeing today is what was basically happened over 6,000 years of evolution. So some people say sari is Indian, but you know it's it's hard to put it in that bucket. Yes, people in uh, Indian subcontinent do wear saris, but if you look at all of the influences, I really think it's one of the truly global garment that's out there right now, uh, because all of the other ones sort of evolved with their own countries, whereas it, the sari truly evolved with people who came from other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. So please, please tell me to stop if you have any questions or any comments. Uh, there are, yes, we'll talk about those, though I don't have a slide, but we, we, we can talk about it. So let's, let's now talk about how saris are made. So in 7,000 7, years ago, People made saris. Um, it's actually not much known about how exactly they did the weaving part because one of the major weaving influences uh, came with the Mughals and came with the Persians. So that's really when it became a little bit more mechanized. Until then, people were uh, using some, there were mechanical means, but not very evolved. So to make fabric was difficult. Uh, the, Persians influenced uh, the fabric making in India. And that's when one of the first uh, semi-mechanized looms were born. Uh, and saris were, were very much made on something that looked like this. It's called a loom. And what it has is um, threads going in the vertical direction. And then with hand, you go in the horizontal direction, back and forth with a shuttle. You could have one shuttle or you could have multiple shuttles. One person can weave a sari, two people can weave a sari. So it could be as simple uh, as just a piece of fabric like something you see here. This is simply a piece of fabric that's dyed or it could have intricate woven work on it, which is this. So this is called extra weft, so it's, you have the vertical and horizontal lines going on this part of the fabric, 
but to create these motifs, the weaver uses another thread and creates these little motifs. So that's basically how a sari is made. When the sari is made by hand on a loom like this, it's called a hand loom because all of this work is done by hand and there are no machines involved. But saris have evolved and a lot of saris are made on the machines and super fast machines. So some of these saris here, like this one, is made on a machine. Whereas the sari that I'm wearing or this sari is made by hand. So, so hand loom is when a sari is made by a person on a, on a loom like this. Power loom is when it's made on a machine. Um, and both saris exist in India. In fact, the Banarsi I've got is a power loom sari because I don't have a <laughs> issue. I don't have a good Banarsi sari to bring with us. <laughs> um, so um, now fabrics that the saris were made from also evolved with time. Um, cotton was the only fabric available in India. Oh, the, the, the vertical and horizontal, right? So, <laughs> issue is wrap the horizontal or the vertical? The, the yes, this is, so the, this is the warp and this is the weft. And you can use different fibers in each direction. So people can use silk uh, in one direction, cotton in another, silk in one direction, linen in another, like there are thousands of combinations that you can do depending on the fiber that you are using. Um, so, yes. It is same, same kind, yes. Yes, it's, it's just the direction that, uh, so if it's in the, this is, so we are calling this vertical direction which is the length of the sari. So right, so this is, this is the six yard direction. So that's the wrap. <laughs> I always get confused between the two. And then the other side is the weft, which is the one yard, yeah. Uh, so a typical sari, and there is no, nothing typical about sari, as we all know, uh, is about six yards, and it's about a yard wide. So it's about 42 inches to about 48 inches. And that's why sari is sort of a one size fits all garment. Because for me, I'm a shorter person, so I tuck in a little bit more. Uh, if somebody's taller, then you just tuck in a little bit less. But you can pretty much, any size person or any gender person, the original sari was actually gender neutral. Because both men and women wear it the same, wore it the same way. So, so just have to keep that in mind. And I don't have a slide about men, uh, how they have evolved sarees and, and how they are wearing it today, but there is a whole evolution going on in India right now about men trying to wear the sari back, back like how they wore it 7,000 years ago. So it's really cute. But anyway, so this handloom distinction is really important because it, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of history behind the handloom and there is a lot of economic setup that, that is evolved around the handloom and weaving of sarees. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the fibers that are used. So originally only cotton was used, but the Chinese, they brought silk to India. And India t now has about four different kinds of silk, mulberry, muga, eerie, and tussar. And they all are from different types of worms, and don't ask me to pronounce any of the names. But um, the only one I know, which is the easiest one, is the iri silk. And iri comes from the word ira, which is uh, a Assamese name for castor. So these little worms, they eat the castor leaves, they make the silk, and each silk has a distinctive texture. So mulberry is very lustrous and smooth, kind of like this, uh, whereas tusser is very coarse and rough. So just depending on the type of the worm, they make different types of silks. Uh, there is also finishing involved, so, so a lot of different things. But all of these fibers are natural fibers. 
we also know chiffon and georgette to be silks, right? It's just a different type of twisting and weaving, makes the fiber a little crinkled, and then you get your chiffon and georgette. Then everybody's favorite fiber is, of course, cotton and then linen, which also is made in abundance in abundance in India. So saris are made from those. Though lin linen saris are more recent development. I, I don't think people made linen saris back then, right? Yeah. So, and then more recently, I would say within the last 50 years or, or so, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, people have started making saris with mixed fibers. So where you wrap, wrap and ref, weft, you go into diff with two different types of fibers. So one can be silk, another one could be polyester or nylon. And you could also mix cotton and silk in each direction. So, so the now I, I spoke a little bit about the weaving sector, and it's very important. Um, it's very, this is something that I'm very passionate about and some of my friends who are here are also very passionate about because Indian economy back then uh, was very textile focused. India is still the biggest textile hub in the country, not only for just the, the textile itself, but also for embroideries and, and embellishments and stitching like, so there is a lot of um, economic uh, reliance that comes from not only saris, but just weaving of fabrics that happens in India. It's a very uh, vibrant culture. So India has 136 unique weaves. Don't ask me to name them all. <laughs> but, but, and there are like hundreds and thousands of painting, um, embroidery and hand dyeing techniques that are used in various textiles in India. And almost all of them are also used to make saris in one form or the other. Um, now, India also has the largest share of cotton yarn. And they export a lot of that cotton yarn. It's also something that, uh, and, and something very important about the hand weaving part is that India contributes to the to 95 percent of fabric that's woven by hand. So the loom you saw earlier, the picture of the loom, it mostly happens in India and doesn't happen in other countries anymore. They used to make hand woven fabrics in France, Belgium, some parts of Asia, Japan, uh, China. However, it has pretty much become extinct in other parts of the countries but it's still going in India. And the reason, uh, a, a big reason for that is people like saris are keeping it alive. Because owning a hand woven sari is still something that every woman in India wants. So, um, so if hand woven textile, you know, if, I mean, I honestly think that uh, owning a hand woven piece of fabric is something that needs to be treasured and more people in the world need to, need to know about it. And that is something that can expand globally. And if it did expand globally, then it will really save jobs and create a very vibrant economy in India. So just something to know about the hand woman piece. Now, of all of the 136 weaves we talked about, there are five. They are considered the royal weaves or the crown jewels of the weaves. And those are Banarsi. Balucheri, the sari that I'm wearing, Chanderi, Kanjivaram, and Paitani. And I, we have those here. This is a Kanjivaram. It's a weave from southern India. This is a Paitani, which is a brocade style of weaving. It's sort of a cousin of a Banarsi. It's a similar weaving technique, but different motifs. This is a Chanderi. And it has the most amazing... Now, you know, I don't think they make the real chanderi fabric anymore, but it has the most amazing, softest silk in the lightest quality that you can imagine. So these, these four here and the one I'm wearing are called the royal weaves. And the reason they are called the royal weaves is various kings in India and at different points of time um, during their, you know, um, their reign, they provided uh, funds and patronage 
to weavers who, wo who would weave these saris. And then they became more and more elaborate. So everybody wanted to own a piece of a Banarsi or a piece of a Paichani that was most intricately woven and had the best motives and made, was made from the best silks. So these saris got better and better because they had the backing of the kings from those eras. And these five saris, and you know, people would say, oh, there are more than five, but these are sort of my list of five. <laughs> So with a little asterisk. There are other weaves that are equally good. Uh, there is Venkatgiri, which is sort of a cousin of the Kanjivaram. There is Gadwal, which is also a cousin of the Kanjivaram. And they all look gorgeous and are equally intricate. Um, so depending on who you talk to, they may have their own list of five. But definitely Banarsi will always be on top of everybody's list. Kanjivaram would always be a top of on top of everybody's list. The Banarsi comes from northern India and has the biggest influence of the Mughals. You will see it in their weaving, in the motifs they use, and the type of fabric uh, technique, the fabric weaving techniques that they use, has the highest influence from the Mughal eras. As you go south, it's a different type of dynasty, um, you know, is it the Tanjavar? Aishu, by the way, Aishu is my friend, and she's also an expert, and she's here to support. Uh, so sometimes I'm going to call on her if I'm missing a fact here and there. Um, these uh, were influenced by the Marathas, and the peacocks are the characteristics of these type of saris. So you, later on, you can come and touch them, up and you can see how they are woven. Yes. Yes, yes. There is, exactly. So the name of the weaves are based on the town that they are woven in. So Banarsis are woven in Banaras. Kanjivarams are woven in Kanjipuram, in Paitan. So the name of the town or the region signifies. And, and that comes from, again, the kings who ruled on that part of the country and provided the praetorius. Thank you for say, you know, asking that question, because it was in my notes, but I forgot. <laughs> um, now, another thing that was also brought in by the Persians and the Mughals was embroideries on the saris. Now, I don't have all different types of embroideries here, but um, Zardozi is a type of embroidery that was brought in by um, the Persians when they came. Uh, also, Mughals brought in all different kinds of embroidery. In fact, this uh, this is, though it's done on machine, and thank you for bringing this in, this is also a type of embroidery you, you will see in the northern state of Kashmir. This little border here is Zardozi, and this is Ari work, similar to Ari work. Though this is, it's done in Kashmir in the northern state, and it has a Mughal influence on it. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of those techniques, embroidery techniques, are then adopted on saris um, and also on different types of fabrics. I have another one here. This is called fulkari. This is also a handmade type of embroidery. And it's creating geometric uh, patterns on fabric. Um, so there are hundreds of types of embroideries in India. Uh, some uh, I have mentioned here, the first one is called Gara, and it came with the Persians. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's, it creates a very lush embroidery um, pattern on the sari. And these are some of the most expensive saris to own in India. In fact, um, I have a milestone birthday coming up soon, and I've started saving for it you know, for like last few years. So hopefully I'll be able to own it. Uh, Kasuti is another one where there is geometric pattern created. There is Kashida, uh, Kani, Tila, Ari, Fulkari. There is Choda embroidery that's done in the south. I mean, you name it, there are literally hundreds of types of embroideries. Yes. So, well, you, you, have, you keep looking at it for a while and then you know. But one of the things that, um, one of the way to identify a, if an embroidery is handmade or not, is to look at the reverse side. And you need to see threads and imperfections. If you see that on the reverse, 
if, if the pattern is not uniform, then it's not authentic. Because what happens is when it's done on machine, it's very precise. So uh, you know, if anybody says, oh, I have this sari, would you take a look and tell me if it's authentic or not? We say, hey, can you send a picture of the reverse side? And then usually we can tell. So in this one, you can clearly see how the thread has moved from one square to the other. So you can tell that this is hand handmade. Uh, but if it's very perfect and every little stitch is same as the other one, then it's not. Other techniques that are used to make saris are tie-dye. And I have some tie-dye saris here. Um, there is bandhani, which is this, which is the tie-dye technique where you use a tiny little piece and try a thread around it, and then it's dyed. So it creates these white white little circles where the piece was tied. So you know we all know how tie-dye is done. But then uh, we also have a leria, which I didn't put it up, which is instead of creating circles, you create lines on the fabric. And we can see it later on. Uh, now, even j just like there were influences in the weaving techniques, there were also Im influences in tie-dye techniques from other countries. So this one is a Japanese technique uh, called shibori. And this sari is made with the shibori tie-dye technique. Um, then there are there is a bandha technique, and what bandha really means is instead of tying the fabric, they tie the fibers before the sari is made. So uh, patola, which is another really expensive sari where you break break your bank uh, trying to buy it, they c they tie the sari in ba both wrap and wrap and weft, and they literally tie every single fiber, and then they weave it. To create the pattern, so it's not it's not a fabric that's tied. It's literally the fiber that's tied, and then pattern is created. So, uh -huh. some really complicated, very intensive ways of arts. And finally, painting and printing. So we we talked about the weaving, then we talked about um, embroidery. And the last way to sort of embellish a sari is by painting or printing on the sari. And this is a batik. Uh, it has Indonesian influence. Uh, this is basically a wax resist. So you know you you uh, put wax on the sari, you dye it, then you put wax in other parts, and then you dye it, and it takes um, uh, sort of several days. But this one has some fish design on it. And you can get like beautiful colors and design. Uh, this is a painting technique called kalamkari. And don't come too close to this sari because it really smells bad. And the reason for that is the dyes are natural dyes. And for the, those dyes to adhere, adhere to the fabric, they, ca they use all kinds of things. They use sour milk. They use like cow dung. I mean, just you name it. But it, it looks spectacular when it's done. It's all made by hand. And every single thing in there is natural. So the colors are used are made from lac, madder, turmeric, and the most famous Indian dye called indigo, which we have seen all over the world. Um, this is also a painting, painting technique. This is called a madhubani. Everything you see here, and we can open it later to see uh, the work on the pallu. It's, yeah, sure. And you will see the intricate work that they do. Again, everything is done by hand. No, this is hand done. Yeah, this is hand painted. Yes, so we'll, we'll talk about the block print next. Now. Since you mentioned block print, we also have an example of block printing. And it's this sari over here. So this, this sari has two different techniques. It has tie-dye, and it has block printing. The, the block printing on this sari is called adrak, which also came from Persia and Morocco. And you will see some Moroccan motifs on this sari, actually. So there is Moroccan influence on it. And it also uses you know, turmeric and indigo 
in it. And so this is my absolute favorite block printing technique. I probably have, I don't know, Ishu, I lost count. What, 18 saris in this, in, in this technique? Because I just love the motifs, and I love the colors, and the, the vibrancy. But then you also have, uh, there are other block printing techniques. Yes. Yes. So thank you, Aishu, for that. And, so, and there are similar techniques. So dabu, another mud resist technique. So you, you block print and you throw mud on the sari, and that helps it set. Uh, then there, are, there is bark print from Central India. There is a cola. I mean, you name it. There are so many uh, block printing techniques as well. Uh, but I didn't bring all of those. I just brought a couple uh, to show as examples. Uh, there are also. Uh, painting techniques that come from uh, east and west of India called Patachitra and Pichwai, which all, you know, again, I didn't bring those. Now, once you have made these beautiful saris with your gorgeous weaving and your beautiful painting and all of that, you have to you drape them, right? And draping, as we saw, uh, evolved over time. So it was not just. Um, tying it around your waist, people started experimenting, and then also it became a regional thing. So each region has its own way of draping the sari. The, the two very common ones, this, depending on who you talk to, is called Sidha Pallu or Ulta Pallu. So Sheetal calls it Gujarati style. We call it Ulta Pallu because for, for us, from where I come from, this is the normal way of wearing sari. So there is no normal way, right? <laughs> but where Sheetal comes from, she her pallu doesn't go behind the shoulder. It actually comes to, towards the front. So depending on who you talk to, Sida means the right side. What's the right side? So this is, this is one of the most common ways of wearing sari. What I am wearing is another most common way of wearing sari. Uh, but then there are real variations. So this is that Gara sari I told you about, the one that I've been saving up for like last five years. Just look at the elaborate work on like the pallu and all the designs, I mean, it's amazing. This is similar to how women wear saris like 7,000 years ago. This is where the drape actually goes in between your legs and it's stuck behind your back. And then there is also a pallu. So it has like two or three different styles, but this is, um, from a region called Karnataka in India. This, again, this is called a Mardi Sar. That it's, it's from a region Aishu comes from. And this is a nine yard sari, not a six yard sari. It's a much longer sari. It's draped in a different direction. It's from Southern India. This is very, very similar to the drape you saw in one of the very first pictures I showed. This is called a Agri drape. It's from a tribe in Maharashtra where I come from. So again, a lot of these drapes exist. And if you want to learn more about it, there is a person who actually has documented every single drape and has made films about how to drape in that. Uh, yes, issue. So now we know about you know, how women wear sari. But let's talk now about how sari is today taken up in the popular culture. Um, now there, are, there are a couple of women who, um, you know, politicians who wore sari every day. First one, the first female prime minister ever in the world, Siri Mao Bandar Naike of Sri Lanka. She wore a sari every single day. She became Sri Lankan prime minister, I think, in 1970. After that, Indira Gandhi became prime minister. So a lot of people think Indira Gandhi was the first woman to wear saris as like you know a, a big political leader, but she wasn't. It was actually Sri Lankan. And then Sheikh Hasina from Bangladesh, she was another uh, woman prime minister who only wore saris, and she wore the most exquisite jamdanis, similar to the one we have here. Uh, so a lot of these power, powerful women wear, wore saris every single day and, you know, kicked ass, <laughs> to, to, to say the least. Here you see uh, Reagan with Indira Gandhi, and she's wearing a very simple printed pure silk sari. So this is a pure silk sari 
with a block printing technique similar to that one. And it, it said that he was really, really impressed by you know, how she conducted herself and her poise and not to mention her saris. This is Shirley MacLaine. She, uh, you know, you know, in terms of endearment, right? Like everybody knows that movie. She played an Indian princess in a movie. And then she was so impressed by sari that she wore them like almost for every party. There are thousands of pictures of her in saris if you were to look it up. One picture I could not find was, um, you know, our vice president. Kamala Harris in a sari. Now, there is a picture of her in her 20s wearing a sari, but there are no recent pictures of her wearing saris. So I'm probably going to write to her and see if we can change that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, Sheetal actually has met. Yeah. But you meet Biden, which is, yes. But, you know, we sh yeah, that's the one in her 20s where she visited her, her grandparents and wore a sari. Yes. Uh, and this last, these two pictures uh, are of more of a modern sari. This is actually a Chanel sari. So Chanel is now making saris. Um, and then um, Dior actually recently did a fashion show in Mumbai. And they had a version of sari and all of these elaborate embroideries. So a lot of designers are now showing up in India taking what saris have to offer. They are either modifying saris or using it in their own clothes. So when my husband asked me, why am I spending all this money on saris, I tell him, it's, they're going to get very expensive, so I'm investing, so, you know. But this last one is a very famous Indian act actress called Deepika Padukone, and she's like, think of her as, I don't know, Julia Roberts, <laughs> for lack of a better term. She's wearing a sari by a designer called Sabya Sachi, and he's really, like the most famous, most exorbitant, and most glorious designer who is um, making saris right now. And he has a store in New York. So if you are in a mood to spend your entire retirement fund, uh, please do visit and just see all the amazing things he has to offer. Yeah, he, I mean, he does. No, he, no, he does design them. But of course, he has people who will actually do the weave and the embellishment and all of that. But he, he does, like he gets involved in the creative process. People think he's one of the, you know, creative geniuses. Yeah, yeah. So he's, yeah, I've been, he, it, I don't know if it has become a design house yet where he has several people making his designs and he's just lending the label. I don't think that is the case right now, but he's probably not too far from it. Yeah. Now, people also do all kinds of things in saris. Like, I can't go to the grocery store or even climb the stairs up and down. Like, I'm super clumsy. But there are women who have run marathon. This, is a, uh, this, this woman ra ran the entire full marathon in a sari in Manchester. Uh, this is uh, a woman, you know, rollerblading in a sari, a woman skiing in sari. And then this is Bitri's words. I don't know what she's trying to do in a sari, but um, <laughs> she is another uh, artist. She lived in Europe and basically lived in saris, like pr pretty much all her life. Um, now, this is one of my last slides. I think I don't think I have any more slides, and then we can get into like sari draping and all of that. But the most important thing about sari is that sari is more than a fabric. Sari is a sentiment, and it's usually attached to an emotion or a uh, something big event happening in your life. So every, almost every Indian bride will wear a red sari for her wedding. Uh, right now, this this these ten days, we have a festival called Navratri going on, and each day we wear a different color sari. So today is the color red, and I'm wearing a red sari because. Um, because of the color, which is a more of a modern day thing, is just getting women to spend more money on saris. But um, you know, your parents will give you a sari every time you visit them after you get married, or your in-laws will give you a sari the first time you go to their house. Uh, so, so there is a sentimental value associated with saris. Saris are also passed along from generation to generation. So this blue sari here. 
this belonged to my friend's mother and then her mother gave it to her and then she gave it to me and I'm going to probably pass it to my daughter. So, you know, so there are several generations, you know, and, and the silk is delicate. So at some point the silk will start giving up. And then people start repurposing saris because they don't want to give up that emotion that's attached to that sari, right? So, so they may make like a blouse out of it or, or a, put it in a little frame so they have a piece of that sari um, associated, uh, you know, a memory associated with that sari. So, so. so oh, she, it's probably has like several pins attached. It's uh, yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. No, it, it does not. In fact, this this weekend I went to a gurudwara, which is you know the Sikh religion, and it's their temple. And their decorum is that your head absolutely has to be covered at all times. And I, what I ended up doing was holding the sari like this with my hand because it would just fall off of my head every second. So, so but they do keep put some pins and you know, some like stuff to, to hold it in place. Uh, they also have some tapes and stuff these days from what I've heard. But uh, yeah, so this is our last slide. And um, you know, this is about how Sari has evolved and who are the people who are sort of still keeping it alive. Um, so the reason Aishu and I met is because of this lady over here in the corner. Her name is Madhu. And she created a group of people who loved saris here in Boston. So, so now we have like 80, 80 people and we meet regularly. And uh, it's, it's all started because of a Facebook group, believe it or not, called Sari Speak. And it, it was single-handedly responsible for reviving a lot of forgotten saris making more women wear saris, or sort of like started a revolution. But there are a lot of Instagram influencers, just like you know everywhere else. So I, I list a couple of people here. Uh, one is Vijayalakshmi Chabra. She is, I mean, a real woman of substance. She was head of Doordarshan. So what that means is, if, like, think about it as head of CBS. You know, and India only has one public uh, television or had only one public television uh, source and she was heading that and she was really a influential powerful women woman and she wore saris all her life now she has taken to Instagram and she writes exclusively about saris their history each weave how it is different than another one and just it's phenomenal to follow her and read her tech uh, re read her posts on Instagram another one this uh, lady here called Isha, and her, her handle is Desi Drapes. And she is very, um, you know, she, she's sort of a sari historian. So that story I told you about Shirley McLean, she first documented that and told us about, um, you know, how various people all around the world basically love saris. And she has amazing collection of all these women who wore saris and how they evolved and how they adopted them and how the sari fashion you know evolved over time so if you have time do follow her and then uh, this summer sheetal went to london and sent me some pictures from this um, exhibition at the design museum in london called the offbeat sari and it's about how sari has become evolved and has become modern so uh, this picture right here um, this is, this is from Met Gala. So this sari was worn at the Met Gala. It's paired with a bustier, and it's by that same designer I told you about, Sabbisachi, the one who's like, you know, who you would spend your entire life savings on. Uh, so it's really about sari has just become more than a traditional fabric to how it has become modern and glamorous and how, you know, it's adapted by all over the world. So people like. Naomi Campbell are wearing it, and Chanel is making saris now. So, uh, so that's yeah, that's where we are today with saris. And you know, over seven thousand years, it has seen a lot of uh, things. Yes. It's, 
So thank you, everybody.